Pike grew up learning from a powerful demon warlock named Romerk, who taught him about an old, advanced civilization that used to rule. With his natural skill and magic, Pike's a magician in the demon army, and this guy's got insane power and skills. Because of that, he's been promoted to commander, leading his team to one victory after another against the humans. But Ike is hiding a big secret, he's actually human. He knows the consequences if anyone ever finds out, but he's ready to take that risk. His goal is to find a way for demons and humans to live in peace and finally put an end to the long-lasting war. Right now, he's leading a mission to take over Aram's fort with his crew. He's strategizing how to handle his army. And surprisingly, they manage to break down the fort walls faster than he expected. His pig-like assistant fills him in, saying it's because Ike gave the orcs a battering ram just like he planned. Inside the city walls, humans and demons are clashing hard, and the demons are totally dominating. Ike decides to visit the human army's commander, and as soon as the commander sees Ike, he recognizes him instantly. Ike's earned a reputation as the commander of the Demon Lord Army's 7th Corps, also known as the Undying Brigade. Ike gives the human commander three options. 1. Surrender and hand over his lands. 2. Go out like a warrior and end it himself. Or 3. Run away while Ike just relaxes and enjoys the view. The human commander is shocked to see a demon showing mercy, but he's not down with any of the options so he straight up attacks Ike. But Ike's not one to mess with, he takes the commander out with a single spell. The pig-like assistant rushes over to check on Ike, and he's super relieved to see Ike is fine. Ike then tells him to help the wounded commander and the soldiers who surrendered. The assistant is completely shocked by how merciful Ike is being. Meanwhile, there's this super hot bitch watching Ike through a magic crystal. She can't believe Ike managed to take over Arsum with just one brigade in a week. But deep down, she always knew he had potential. Ike, on the other hand, is chilling in a room and throws up a barrier spell to keep it secure. He looks out at all the destruction from the battle and starts feeling guilty for all the lives lost. No matter what, he knows he's never going to get used to all the blood and violence. That's when he drops a big secret. He's not a demon, he's actually human. Ike explains that his teacher, Romer, was this legendary demon mage who knew all about an advanced civilization that used to exist in their world. Even though Ike was human, Romerg took him in, raised him, and taught him everything he knew about magic. Before Romerg died, he warned Ike to never talk about the advanced civilization, because it could lead to disaster. He also told Ike to never take off his mask and robe because if the demon lord found out he's human, there would be no forgiveness. Ike, being all serious, promised to follow the advice like a little kid wearing his Halloween costume. Then Ike thinks to himself, this room is totally locked down with my barrier, no one's getting in without my say-so. But suddenly, he's shocked to spot a maid hiding under the table he's sitting at. But guys I bet you only the god knows what is happening here. She's freaking out, begging him to f*** her. Sorry guys I mean she is begging not to kill her, saying she didn't see anything. As if the situation couldn't get any more ridiculous, the clumsy maid accidentally bangs her head on the table and passes out. Ike's just standing there, not believing that the secret he's kept hidden for 20 years got revealed in just 30 seconds, like all of you guys. Next, we see Ike strolling around Arsum with his piggy assistant by his side. The piggy mentions that they've taken control of the city but wonders if letting too many humans survive might be a problem. Ike tells him not to worry, reminding him that the current demon lord isn't like the old one, he only cares about results. The piggy then says that some of the other leaders want to wipe out the people and burn the town to the ground. But Ike, being practical, points out, if we kill everyone, who's going to pay taxes? Arsum is a major trading city, and without people, all that trade will just vanish. Suddenly, Ike spots a crowd of people waiting to talk to him. The piggy tries to shoo them away, saying they don't have the authority to speak to someone like Ike. But Ike ignores him and tells the humans to go ahead and speak. One of them nervously asks how much they'll have to pay in taxes now. To their surprise, Ike tells them the tax rate will stay the same, and they're all relieved. But Ike doesn't let them off easy. He warns them that if they resist the demon army, there will be consequences. Before Ike can get their response, he's suddenly zapped into a dark labyrinth. There, he's attacked by a monster he can barely see. It turns out the hot bitch from earlier summoned him there. Ike's annoyed and reminds her that she promised not to yank him out of thin air anymore. He quickly takes down the monster with one of his cool spells. The woman, who introduces herself as Sephiro, the commander of the Demon Lord's Army's 7th Corps, comments that Ike's gotten stronger. But guys how this b knows he became stronger, tell me in the comment if you know guys. I am the one, the way your son don't need a-
Pike explains that she's his boss and the only demon who knows his secret. He then tells her, instead of summoning me out of nowhere every time, why not just send a message like a normal person? Sephiro smirks, saying that wouldn't be as fun. Pike suspects she summoned him to make his report, but Sephiro says she already knows everything thanks to her familiars. Confused, Ike asks why he's here then. Sephiro reveals that Demon Lord Darrow wants to meet Ike in person, which is a big deal. No other brigade commander has gotten this kind of honor before. Ike wonders why the Demon Lord is interested in him, and Sephiro mentions that it's probably because he managed to capture Arsum in just one week. She offers to teleport him to the Demon Lord, but he has to put his hand on her shoulder. Ike hesitates, but eventually does it. Sephiro looks disappointed. She is thinking about another round in bed, but Ike's is too exhausted because of Maid. With that, she teleports them both to the Demon Lord's location. Meanwhile, the Maid from earlier wakes up and tries to slip out of the room, only to realize she's stuck inside Ike's barrier spell. She notices some food left behind with a note she can't read, but hunger wins, and she digs in. Turns out, the food is amazing, and she devours it like she hasn't eaten in days. Cut to Ike and Sephiro nearing the Demon Lord's castle. The thick miasma surrounding the area starts making Ike feel uneasy since, unlike everyone else, he's not a demon. As they approach the castle gates, Ike spots a magician standing at the entrance, further heightening his tension. Ike's thinking, wait, does this magician check everyone who enters the castle? Sephiro confirms it, and Ike starts to worry. If they make him take off his mask and robe, his true identity as a human might get exposed. But Sephiro tells him not to stress, and she surrounds him with a powerful aura using her magic. The magician, noticing this, is impressed and says, I'd expect nothing less from Romerg's grandson. Ike is shocked that the magician knew his grandfather, but the magician explains that Romerg was a well-known master magician. Before Ike can process this, Sephiro hurries him along, reminding him that the demon lord is waiting. As they step into the massive Demon Lord's castle, Dober BG, Ike is amazed by how huge it is. It's clearly designed to show off the Demon Lord's insane power and magical skills. The long walk down the never-ending hallway is exhausting, and Ike can't help but feel a little jealous of Sephiro, who's flying effortlessly next to him. He's always wanted to master flight magic, but the best he can do is jump super high. Finally, they reach the gate to the throne room. Sephiro heads in first to chat with the Demon Lord while Ike waits outside. As he waits, Ike's mind races. This is the Demon Lord who turned the tide of the war against humanity with just one battle. The rumors say he's insanely strong, ruthless, and quick to kill anyone incompetent, friend or foe. But if he spots potential in someone, he'll put them to work, even if they aren't physically strong or magically gifted. He's a true meritocrat who's completely restructured the Demon Army. Demons are usually loners, always fighting amongst themselves, but this demon lord, Darrow, changed everything. After a bit, Sephiro gives Ike the signal to enter. He steps into the throne room and immediately bows his head before the demon lord. But when he's told to look up, Ike is stunned. Sitting on the throne is a girl who is hot as f**k. Ike's mind races, and he is thinking f**k this as soon as possible. Sorry guys I mean Ike's mind races, did the demon lord's daughter get out of daycare early? But no, this is the infamous demon lord everyone's been talking about. She praises him for taking down Arsum in just a week, but Ike humbly replies that he was just following orders and that Sephiro deserves most of the credit. Darrow chuckles and says, you're as humble as a human. At that moment, Ike starts sweating nervously, realizing just how close his secret could be to getting exposed. Sephiro casually tells the demon lord, he's Romerg's grandson, the guardian of hell. The demon lord, Darrow, nods and says, that explains why you're so humble. You must be a deep thinker, that's probably why you didn't kill the leader or massacre the people of Arsum. She acknowledges that Ike took the city with minimal casualties. Ike starts questioning if maybe he should have listened to his piggy assistant, and killed the humans like suggested, but deep down he knows he can't do that because, well, he's human too. He doesn't want to mess things up, so he asks the demon lord for permission to speak. Darrow gives him the go-ahead, telling him he can speak his mind. Ike explains that while humans might fear terror, they don't submit to it. He points out that if you compare towns where demon leaders executed people to towns where they didn't, the more peaceful approach is better for productivity, and helps the demon army in the long run. Darrow wonders aloud if that's how Romerg thought too, and Ike confirms it. As they chat, Ike starts thinking that the demon lord must also know about the ancient civilization and has been using that knowledge to revolutionize the demon army. Before leaving, Darrow comments that Ike is different from other demons and says she'd like to see the face behind his mask one day. After she's gone, Ike takes off his mask and breathes a sigh of relief. 
He was super nervous, realizing that Darrow was starting to pick up on his mask situation. Sephiro teases him, saying he should be thankful the demon lord didn't figure out he's actually human. She then mentions that Darrow gave him a reward, though it feels more like a punishment to Ike. The scene shifts to Ike returning to the room where he had set up the barrier. He finds the maid passed out after stuffing herself with the food he left. Before waking her up, he is thinking about how to clap her in the night. What do you mean by that? But she immediately starts apologizing and begging for mercy again. Ike reassures her, telling her to chill. He's not going to hurt her. Curious, he asks for her name. She introduces herself as 13, which Ike finds pretty strange. She explains that she's a slave, and slaves are given numbers instead of names, but her mother called her Sadie. Realizing that Sadie knows his human secret, Ike can't just let her go. She promises to keep it forever and sticks by his side, practically glued to him. Ike believes her and declares that from now on, she's going to be his maid. Sadie is thrilled, overjoyed at the new turn of events. The scene cuts to Ike now ruling over a city called Yelas. He remembers that this is the reward Sephiro mentioned earlier. She had told him that Yelas is farther south than Arsum and right on the front lines of the war. Even though it's a small town, it's crucial for the demon army. His mission, protect the city and bring in double the tax revenue. Ike turns to his piggy assistant and says they need to fix the city walls immediately, asking how long it'll take. Piggy says it'll be about six months, but Ike knows they don't have that much time. He racks his brain for a solution and suddenly gets an idea. He tells Piggy they're going to fix the walls in just one month. Piggy is convinced it's impossible, but Ike isn't planning on using just human power. Next thing we see, both humans and demons are working together to repair the walls. Piggy is blown away, seeing the two races working in harmony. He thinks to himself, Ike is a genius. Ike explains that he divided the work into 8-hour shifts so that repairs can go on 24-7. And to keep morale high, he's even paying the workers. Ike also uses his magic to speed up the repairs, which further impresses Piggy. Watching all this, Piggy starts thinking that if he sticks by Ike, his life is going to be set. He even imagines that Ike might become the next demon lord someday. The war between humans and demons is still raging. And right now, the demons have the upper hand. This has Darrow feeling pretty confident. However, their intel shows that the humans are about to team up with a neighboring kingdom. And if that alliance happens, it could completely turn the tide of the war. So, Darrow decides to trust Ike with leading a crucial attack to stop this from happening. Meanwhile, in the human kingdom, the badass knight known as the White Rose, Alistair, is summoned to help reclaim Yelis. They can't afford to lose another stronghold, so she's been called in to handle the situation. As soon as she gets her mission, she heads out, ready to take action. At the same time, Ike and Sadie are on their own mission within the human kingdom. However, Sadie ends up getting caught in a shady street game where a con artist tells her all she has to do is guess which cup the ball is under, and if she's right, He'll double whatever money she bets. Sadie makes her choice, but when it's time to place her bet, she realizes she doesn't have any money because Ike never trusts her with finances. The con artist gets annoyed, thinking she wasted his time, but then he gets a second look at Sadie Melons and suggests she can pay him off another way if she loses, but guys tell me in the comment, what would you like to prefer? Cat! Right at that moment, all the cups start floating in the air, revealing that the ball was never under any of them. The other people who had lost money to the con artist realize they've been scammed, and things get heated as they start threatening him to get their money back. In the middle of the chaos, Ike shows up, pulls Sadie away, and reminds her that she's supposed to stay by his side as his maid. Sadie apologizes, saying she was just curious. She then notices that Ike is rocking a new outfit. He explains that they're on a mission to spy on the enemy, so they can't be walking around in their usual demon disguises. Ike and Sadie start strolling through town when they spot a whole platoon of soldiers marching through the streets. That's all Ike needs to confirm that the kingdom is really forming this alliance. He knows these alliances have kicked the demon lord's army back to the castle before, so it's definitely a serious threat. Sadie is worried too, thinking the demon army might get defeated again because of this alliance. But Ike teases her, wondering why she's so concerned since she's She's basically a prisoner of the demon army. Sadie explains that her mother was a slave in human society, and she knows that, as a slave herself, she'd always be treated like one in the human world. She gestures towards some poor kids nearby, saying that's how she'd end up if things went back to normal. Ike reassures her, telling her the demon army they have now is the strongest and smartest it's ever been, and they aren't going down easily. As they continue down the street, someone suddenly shouts at them to stop. It's the con artist from earlier, and he's mad that Ike ruined his scam. 
he rolls up with a big guy, thinking he can rob Ike for payback. Ike looks around, noticing there's no one nearby, so he decides it's time to teach the guy a lesson. In a flash, Ike casts a spell, freezing the big guy's legs and summoning icicles that point directly at the con artist. The con artist demands Ike unfreeze his buddy so they can keep robbing him, but Ike isn't playing games. He stabs the guy in the shoulder with an icicle, showing he's not afraid to get serious if the dude doesn't cooperate. Realizing he's screwed, the con artist gives in and agrees to spill everything. Ike asks him what's up with all the soldiers in town since they seem to be in a rush. At first, the con artist claims he doesn't know anything, but when Ike threatens to end him on the spot, the guy starts talking. He spills the beans about the Alliance, explaining that the Rosaria army wants to score some early wins before the Alliance fully kicks in. Ike gets why. They want to rack up kills to earn respect in the strategy meetings. But if they fail, it's going to mess up Rosaria's whole plan. The con artist then reveals that Rosaria's army is likely aiming for Yella's because there's a massive hole in its walls, making it an easy target. With the info he needs, Ike lets the con artist go but conveniently doesn't mention anything about unfreezing the guy. Afterward, Ike and Sadie return to his office. Ike sits at his desk, finishing some paperwork while Sadie brings him tea to help him unwind. Just as things are calming down, a demon girl bursts into the room, demanding to know where Ike's been for the past few hours because she's been worried. Ike stays cool, explaining that he was busy scouting out the kingdom of Rosaria. But his calm explanation doesn't satisfy her, and she quickly turns her frustration toward Sadie, questioning why Ike is keeping a human by his side. Sadie steps forward, introducing herself as Ike's maid, but the demon girl immediately dismisses her, casually calling her an ugly slave. Then, she has the nerve to offer herself as Ike's new maid instead. Sadie, fed up at this point, snaps back, telling the girl to back off because Ike is too tired to be dealing with any drama right now. This sparks a heated argument between the two, with both accusing each other of trying to seduce Ike. Ike, being smart, decides to stay the hell out of it and lets them argue while he keeps his cool. Meanwhile, outside Yella's, the Rosaria army is getting ready to launch their attack. They notice that there aren't many guards patrolling the walls, which seems strange. But they assume it's because the humans are short on manpower to defend their territory. The soldiers report back to Alistair, letting her know that they're all set and just waiting for her command to unleash the attack. Alistair gives the order to fire, but as soon as she does, skeleton soldiers suddenly pop up and surround her forces. The humans initially think they can handle skeletons since they've got siege gear and all, but out of nowhere, one of their soldiers gets blasted by a shot and everything falls apart for them. Realizing that they've lost control of the battle, Alistair quickly calls for a retreat. Ike and his piggy assistant, Gyron, had been watching the whole thing unfold from the top of the wall. They give Alistair credit for making the smart decision to retreat. But let's be honest, the humans only had a shot in the first place because of Ike's earlier recon mission. However, while they're busy watching the battlefield, surprise surprise Mother Flipper an assassin sneaks up behind Ike and shoots an arrow straight into his back. Ike falls to the ground and fucked. Meanwhile, the general just got word that Alistair had to retreat due to some unexpected chaos. A soldier tries to explain that the demon army set up an ambush in advance, but the general isn't hearing any of it. Furious, he orders Alistair to be locked up for failing the mission. The soldier, realizing how dumb that is, tries to reason with the general. He argues that Alistair is one of the most skilled commanders in the kingdom, and throwing her in jail over one loss is only going to crush the soldiers' morale and ruin their chances in future battles. But the general doesn't care and insists on punishing her. Back in Iela's, Ike wakes up in bed, recovering from the arrow wound, only to find Sephiro sleeping next to him. Confused, Ike has a lot of questions. First off, why the hell is she in bed with him? How the dumb Ike guys, if you have a girl beside you, would you ask the question? No, God, please, no, no! But Sephiro dodges the question, claiming she saved his life, and tells him, you have such a good stamina, but guys tell me how much you would to last with her. Back to recap, eventually, she drops the act and explains what happened. After he got shot in the back with that arrow, she healed him. It was a serious wound, but thanks to her magic, he won't even have a scar. As they talk, Sephiro brings up that not a single human was killed during the attack. She knows Ike isn't into unnecessary killing, but she warns him that if he keeps this up, he's going to raise the Demon Lord's suspicions again. Ike understands where she's coming from, but he's trying to find a way for humans and demons to coexist peacefully. Needless bloodshed would only go against everything he's working toward. Sephiro respects his dedication to peace and lets the subject drop, telling him to stay put and get some rest. 
After all, he's still just a human. Once she leaves, Ike takes a closer look at the arrow that shot him. Given what he's been told, he realizes the shot came from behind, which means either someone had to sneak into the castle, or it was a betrayal from someone close to him. Just then, there's a knock at the door. Ike quickly puts on his skeleton mask just as Sadie and Lilith walk in to check on him. They're both worried about Ike, but they're still bickering over who gets to seduce him. Lilith tells Sadie to back off and snuggles up against Ike's arm, but Sadie isn't having it. She wants to get close to Ike too. The two start another argument, but luckily, Jiren steps in just in time. He grabs that bitch, tosses her out of the room, and locks the door behind her, saving Ike from more drama. Lilith starts banging on the door hard, begging to be let back in. But Jiren shouts to shut the fuck up bitch otherwise I will come and bang you all night. Sorry guys I mean Jiren knows she's seriously getting on Ike's nerves. So he keeps her out. Ike appreciates the help and asks Jiren for a favor. He needs to find out where Alistair is being held. After investigating for a few hours, Jiren reports back, saying that Alistair has been thrown in jail because she failed to capture Yelis. Originally, Ike had planned a low-key mission to meet up with Alistair, but Lilith ended up tagging along. She warns Ike that humans can be unpredictable and violent, so it might not be a great idea for him to go meet her directly. Ike, however, is set on seeing Alistair in person because he has some important questions for her. He's also confused about how Lilith even ended up coming along, since he doesn't recall inviting her. Lilith dismisses his concerns, saying it'll be way more exciting with the two of them working together. Plus, after the mission, they can have some fun. But Ike thinking about, what would be the perfect post to clap this bit? What would you like tell me in the comments? She also argues that since Sadie went with Ike last time, it's only fair that she gets a turn. Not in the mood to argue, Ike agrees to let Lilith come along but makes it clear that she'll have to keep up. They finally reach the front gate of the prison, and it doesn't seem all that secure. Lilith smirks, thinking she could probably break in on her own, but Ike stops her, insisting they need to avoid causing any chaos. His plan is to get in, find Alistair, and leave quietly. But before he can even finish, Lilith has already knocked out the guards without hesitation. As they step inside, Ike is surprised by how massive the place is. It's going to take time to track down Alistair's cell. But Lilith has another idea. Instead of wasting time searching, she beats the warden until he hands over the keys and reveals that Alistair is locked up on the top floor. Just as Ike and Lilith are about to head upstairs, a bunch of guards arrive, alerted by the warden's screams. Lilith tells Ike to go ahead and find Alistair while she handles the guards. But before leaving, Ike reminds her not to spill unnecessary blood. Lilith promises not to kill anyone, though as Ike starts climbing the stairs, he hears the guards screaming in pain as bones crack. He brushes it off for now and focuses on reaching Alistair. When Ike finally reaches what should be Alistair's cell, it's completely empty. Before he can process what's going on, a figure sneaks up behind him, attempting to stab him. Ike dodges the attack, quickly pinning the attacker to the ground, only to realize it's Alistair herself. He releases her and demands to know if she sent an assassin to kill him during the last battle, because if it wasn't her, then there's a traitor in his ranks. Instead of answering directly, Alistair steps closer, eyeing Ike suspiciously. She asks if he's really a demon because he doesn't act like one. Ike tries to play dumb, but they're interrupted by the sound of guards approaching fast. Seizing the moment, Alistair presses a knife to Ike's throat and demands to know if he's actually human. She doesn't want to let him go until she gets an answer. With the guards closing in, Ike knows he's running out of time. Promising he won't resist, he remains still, but that doesn't stop him from casting a spell. Before Alistair even realizes what's happening, Ike chants a strange incantation, freezing everyone in place. With everyone immobilized, Ike calmly walks up to the guards and blasts them away with a powerful wind spell, clearing the way. Suddenly, another guard sneaks up on Ike, swinging a mace to take him down. But Ike's quick reflexes kick in, and he dodges just in time. Once he's in the clear, Ike uses his magic to grab the guard and hurl him toward the bridge grate, sending him plummeting to what should be his death. But just before the guard hits the ground, Ike casts another spell to break his fall, saving him. Alistair, watching all of this, is completely confused. Why would a demon go through so much trouble to save a human? But before she can make sense of it, the damaged bridge beneath her starts giving way. Alistair's footing collapses, and she begins falling to her doom. Just like before, Ike swoops in, using his magic to catch her and prevent her from hitting the ground. Alistair is even more baffled now, it makes no sense for a demon to keep saving her life. But Ike brushes off her confusion and finally introduces himself properly. He confidently states that he's the commander of the 7th Army of the Demon Lord. 
Alistair's eyes widen as she pieces it together. Ike is the general who stood his ground against her forces at Ielus. Using his status as a demon commander, Ike insists that there's no way a human could rise to that rank within the demon army. It'd be impossible for a human to climb the ranks like that, and Alistair starts to believe that maybe Ike really is a demon after all. Ike takes the opportunity to ask her again if she was the one who sent an assassin after him during the last battle. But Alistair remains stubborn, refusing to give up any information. She's a proud knight, loyal to her kingdom, and she'd rather die than reveal anything that could help the enemy. Realizing she won't budge, Ike steps in close and decides to take matters into his own hands. He uses mind-reading magic, digging into Alistair's thoughts to find the answers he's been looking for. As Ike is mind-reading Alistair, Lilith barges in, furious. She can't believe Ike is getting cozy with a human girl when she's right there. Lilith tries to get Ike to hug her instead, but he's already gathered all the info he needs from Alistair's mind. Without missing a beat, he says they're leaving. As Ike and Lilith head out, Alistair yells after them, demanding to know why Ike went through all the trouble of breaking into the prison just to walk away without a fight. Ike turns and coolly explains that now he knows she had nothing to do with the assassination attempt. While he was in her mind, he caught glimpses of her thoughts and tells her not to beat herself up about losing the battle for Yelis. He reassures her that even for a skilled commander like her, it's okay to make mistakes as long as she learns from them and moves forward. After dropping that bit of advice, Ike turns to Lilith and tells her it's time to bounce. Lilith thinks he is about clap her, so he suggests they find a private room before heading back. But Ike shuts it down quickly and opens a portal to teleport them both back to the castle. As they vanish, Alistair is left standing there with a whole lot of questions, wondering what the hell just happened and why a demon commander seemed so… different. Back at the house, Ike is greeted by Sadie as he walks in. He tells her he's got a surprise for her, and Sadie, curious, goes over to see what it is. Ike pours a handful of rice into her palm. Sadie's confused. She's never seen rice before and has no idea what it is. Ike explains that he found it in the capital city of Lees and that it's going to be a game changer for Yella's productivity. He explains how he's under orders to double the town's tax revenue. And while Yella's already produces a lot of wheat, switching to growing rice will crank up the town's output. Seeing the blank look on Sadie's face, Ike realizes she doesn't know what productivity means, so he breaks it down for her. He explains that rice is more efficient to grow than wheat, so fewer farmers will be needed in the fields, meaning more people can spend time on other jobs. That way, Yellows will get wealthier as productivity increases. Still, Sadie is struggling to wrap her head around all that economic talk, so Ike simplifies it. Basically, it means people will have plenty of food, and I'll be stacking up that sweet tax money. Finally, Sadie gets it. To kick things off, Ike asks Sadie to whip up something using the rice. But Sadie, having never cooked rice before, asks Ike what she's supposed to do with it. Turns out, even Ike doesn't know, he's never seen rice cooked before either. Sadie's shocked that there's something even Ike doesn't know, and now both of them are clueless on how to handle the rice. All Ike can recall is something vague about cooking it from low to high heat. With that little bit of knowledge, he leaves Sadie to figure it out while he heads into town to handle some important business. A few minutes later, Ike calls out to Jiren, telling him to gather all the soldiers in the courtyard. As the troops assemble, Ike starts piecing together everything he's figured out so far. The arrow from the assassination attempt came from Alistair's army, but after reading her mind, he knows she had nothing to do with it. That means someone else is trying to frame her for the attack. The uncomfortable truth is setting in. There's probably a spy in his own ranks. Determined to find the traitor, Ike uses his mind-reading magic to scan through the thoughts of everyone gathered in the courtyard. After going through each soldier's mind, he finds a goblin freaking out, praying he won't get caught. With his suspicions confirmed, Ike teleports right in front of the goblin and accuses him of being the spy. The goblin's panic says it all. Later, Ike heads over to Sephiro's castle to get some advice. Unfortunately, he teleports in while she's in the middle of a bath. Sephiro doesn't seem to mind being naked in front of Ike, because she has already slept with him but Ike, feeling awkward, says he'll wait outside. Before he can leave, though, Sephiro asks if there's a traitor in his army. That stops Ike in his tracks, he hadn't told anyone about the spy yet. Curious, he asks how she knew. Sephiro just shrugs and says it was a guess. Ike then spills the truth, revealing that the traitor is Jace, a goblin in his ranks. Sephiro isn't surprised, she had been suspicious of Jace for a while. Ike asks her what he should do next, and she steps out of her bath and his bamboo is starts to grow sorry guys I mean she came out with a serious look telling him they're going to make Jace pay for his betrayal. 
Meanwhile, back in Yella's, Jace hears that Ike recently paid a visit to Sephiro. He's baffled. How the hell did Ike recover so fast after getting shot in the back? His confusion quickly turns to panic when one of his crew tells him they've lost contact with their spy in Ike's ranks. Jace knows this can't be good, it probably means Ike's onto him. Realizing he's running out of time, Jace decides to gather his troops and make a move on Ike before he gets exposed. But things go from bad to worse when Jace finds out Ike is already out in the streets, looking for him. Jace steps up to confront Ike, trying to play it cool and acting all friendly, saying Ike should have given him a heads up before showing up unannounced. Ike, unfazed, casually says he was just in the area and thought he'd drop by for a solo visit. But Jace isn't alone, he's brought his entire crew. Ike notices and sarcastically asks if Jace plans on starting a war, given the number of troops he's gathered. Jace gets defensive, pointing out that this is his turf and Ike has no business being here in the first place. He also takes a shot at Ike, bringing up the fact that he was hit with an arrow not too long ago, implying that Ike is losing his edge as a commander. Ike doesn't deny it, he admits he was careless, but who could have predicted a betrayal from within his own squad? Now that the charade is over, Jace drops his friendly act. He taunts Ike, saying it was reckless to come here alone because now Jace and his whole army are going to rip him apart. But Ike isn't intimidated. In fact, he's relieved that Jace brought his entire army. He smirks, saying, now I can take them all out at once. Jace, confused, looks up at the sky and sees a terrifying sight, massive meteors raining down. That's when he realizes it's Sephiro, casting one of her wickedly destructive spells. She loves unleashing her full power so much that she didn't bother to give Ike a heads up to get out of the blast zone. On the ground, Ike's scrambling to avoid getting obliterated. He ducks behind a building just as the meteors hit, cursing under his breath and wishing Sephiro had toned it down a notch so they wouldn't have to rebuild the entire area later. Once the initial explosions die down, phase two of the plan begins. Sephiro orders her skeleton soldiers to start taking out the remaining goblins who survived the meteor strike. And just like that, the slaughter fist kicks off, with the goblin forces being wiped out as Ike watches the chaos unfold. As Jace watches his crew get wiped out, Ike teleports behind him, giving him a choice, surrender now or wait until every last one of his soldiers is dead. Even after witnessing Ike's insane power, Jace foolishly orders his remaining crew to attack Ike. Ike quickly blasts away two goblins charging him from the front with a wind spell, but another goblin tries to stab him from behind. Little did that goblin know, Ike had a shield spell ready. The would-be assassin's attack is deflected and Ike swiftly annihilates the rest of the goblins with his magic. Meanwhile, Jace, true to his cowardly nature, is already making a run for it. He never cared about his soldiers in the first place. Before he can escape cleanly, Sephiro's summoned monster blocks his path, forcing Jace to use a smoke bomb to slip away into a nearby alley. He slinks through a portal and ends up in the forest, thinking he's outsmarted both Ike and Sephiro. But just as he heads toward his secret escape route, Ike fires a massive fireball at him. Shocked, Jace demands to know how Ike found him. That secret path was supposed to be known only to him. Ike calmly explains that he's been tracking Jace with one of his familiars the whole time. With no way out, Ike tells Jace to surrender because there's no chance of winning or escaping. Instead of giving up, Jace makes one last desperate attack, throwing punches at Ike. But with Ike's shield spell in place, Jace's strikes are worthless. Ike retaliates, blasting him back and binding him in magical vines, leaving Jace hanging helplessly. Finally, Jace admits defeat. He starts to realize why the Demon Lord holds Ike in such high regard, and even though he's been beaten, Jace can't help but respect Ike's skills. Then, in a bold move, Jace makes an offer. He suggests that Ike join him in overthrowing the Demon Lord, arguing that the current Demon Lord's rule is too soft. Jace complains about how the Demon Lord won't allow demons to kill humans without a solid reason, even though demons naturally enjoy subjugating and killing them. According to Jace, plenty of demons are unhappy with her rule, and he invites Ike to help bring back the good old days. But Ike isn't interested in Jace's plan. Frustrated, Jace manages to free one of his hands and hurls a knife at Ike. But Ike dodges it with ease, feeling insulted that Jace would even think such a weak move could work against him. With Jace tied up, Ike starts grilling him for more information about who else is plotting to overthrow the Demon Lord. Jace, however, refuses to talk. That's when Sephiro shows up, ready to torture Jace for the information. She's more than eager to get brutal, but Ike asks her to let him handle it peacefully. He doesn't want to resort to excessive harm. Sephiro, whining that Ike's methods are taking way too long, prepares to get rough. Before she can even start, Jace suddenly starts turning purple, screaming in agony. Sephiro hadn't even laid a finger on him. 
realizing what's happening. Ike understands that Jace has been poisoned by his own crew to keep him quiet. Ike quickly tries to use an antidote spell, but the poison is too powerful. It's clear that Jace won't survive much longer. With death closing in, Sephiro asks Jace if he still wants to protect the traitors who poisoned him. Knowing his end is near, Jace finally agrees to spill the names of the rebellion leaders, hoping to get his revenge before it's too late. Once they gather all the crucial intel, Ike and Sephiro roll up to Darrow to inform her about the brewing rebellion, led by none other than the 3rd Division commander, Bastio. Since they're accusing Bastio of straight-up treason, Darrow wants to hear his side of the story. Bastio tries to play the victim, claiming that both Sephiro and Ike are framing him and that they killed Jace to keep him quiet. He even accuses Sephiro of scheming to take control of his third core. These accusations are completely baseless, but they get Sephiro heated. She's ready to lose it, but Darrow steps in, telling her to chill because she'll handle the situation. Darrow, dropping some knowledge on everyone, explains that the more power a demon has, the more they crave. Ambition is the very essence of demonkind, so she can't in good conscience punish a demon for striving to gain more power. That's just how demons are wired. But despite this, she isn't stupid, she knows Bastio is full of lies and isn't falling for his accusations. She also recognizes that Sephiro is still loyal to her. However, Darrow points out that, technically, it's Sephiro's responsibility to keep her subordinates in line. Since Jace's betrayal happened under her watch, it reflects badly on her. According to Demon Law, Darrow should punish both of them, Sephiro for not keeping her crew loyal, and Bastio for stirring up trouble. But Darrow isn't about to lose two core commanders at once, which would be a huge blow to her forces. Instead, Darrow decides that they'll settle things with a duel. Whoever comes out on top gets to keep their life, their core, and their honor intact. Sephira was preparing for the upcoming duel when the Demon Lord sent over the details. She explained to Ike that the duel would be fought with puppets, as neither she nor Bastio was allowed to fight directly. Instead, each would control 50 puppets, and the side that eliminated the other's puppets first would win. Ike found this whole setup needlessly complex, wondering why Darrow didn't just have them fight to the death. Sephiro, however, thought the Demon Lord wanted to test their skills as commanders. As if that weren't strange enough, Sephiro then casually mentioned one last rule Darrow had set. Commanders could appoint someone else to fight in their place. Without hesitation, Sephiro chose Ike to fight for her, putting her life in his hands. Surprised, Ike asked if she was sure she didn't want to handle the duel herself. Sephiro assured him that this was the best approach. While she was physically stronger than Ike, she believed his skills as a commander would give them a better shot at victory. Though uncomfortable with the idea of fighting for Sephiro's survival, Ike realized he had no choice but to step up. He was taken to inspect the puppets he would command. From what he'd been told, all the puppets had equal strength and followed their commander's orders precisely, meaning the only thing that would decide the battle was the skill of the commanders. Ike was also given the option to equip the puppets with weapons of his choice. But as he looked at the gear, he started thinking. Just swords wouldn't cut it. He'd need something smarter if he wanted to secure the win. Later that night, Ike's back at his place, stressing over how to come up with some killer formations for the puppets in the duel. While he's deep in thought, Sadie walks in and hands him a cup of tea. Since she's there, Ike decides to ask her a random question. What would you do if you had to win a fight? Sadie's totally clueless because fighting isn't her thing at all. Ike agrees, saying it's always better to squash problems without throwing punches, but sometimes you're forced into a brawl. Hypothetically, he wants to know what she'd do in that situation. Sadie, with no real experience, says she'd probably use a broom as her weapon of choice. Ike laughs, realizing she's got a point. The best weapon is one that keeps your opponent at a distance while allowing you to strike. He explains that while a sword is better than a dagger, a bow is even more effective because you can hit someone from far away. But he knows Bastio is probably thinking the same thing and will try to use similar tactics. That's when Sadie remembers how her old master used to rave about crossbows, saying they were game changers in battle. Ike agrees, thinking that crossbows would be a solid choice. They can pierce through metal armor and are easier to handle than traditional bows. But for this duel, Ike wants something even more hardcore than crossbows. He decides to settle for the next best thing, guns. Sadie, having never heard of guns before, asks if they're really that powerful. Ike assures her that guns are ridiculously strong, capable of unleashing devastation from hundreds of meters away while the opponent can't even touch you. Sadie thinks that sounds awesome but wonders if Ike has the skills to make something like that. Ike admits he can't pull it off alone, but he's already got a plan. He figures that Sephiro, being an alchemist, could help him whip up some guns. Confident, Ike goes to ask Sephiro for help, but she quickly shuts him down, 
While she's good at creating things, she can't make something she's never seen before. Mike tries explaining to Sephiro that a gun is just an iron tube with gunpowder that launches a bullet, but she waves him off, uninterested. Instead, she casually invites him to join her for a hot swim, completely sidestepping his request. Meanwhile, over at Bastio's camp, word reaches him that Ike is stepping in as Sephiro's commander for the duel. While one of his lackeys assumes that Sephiro must be scared of Bastio, Bastio isn't fooled. He knows Sephiro must have some kind of plan, even if he can't figure out what it is just yet. For the moment, though, Bastio's focus is on the impressive new sword in his hands. His lackey informs him that it's crafted from a dragon's tooth, and they've got the materials to make enough for all their soldiers. But Bastio shakes his head, saying he's going to need way more than just 50 swords for what he's got in mind. He's thinking bigger than anyone realizes. Meanwhile, Ike is just stepping out of the pool with Sephiro, completely blown away by how relaxed she is when his next move could literally cost her life in the duel. As he's drying off, someone tosses him his coat, and he's about to say thanks until he nearly has a heart attack. It's Darrow herself. This is bad news for Ike, who's not wearing his mask. He tries to keep his cool, thinking maybe Darrow won't recognize him. Darrow, unfazed, drops a bag in front of Ike and tells him to open it. When he does, his mind goes into overdrive. Inside are the guns he's been trying to get his hands on. Darrow explains that she went through a lot of trouble to secure them for him. Ike, still trying to play it cool, denies it, not wanting to blow his cover as a human. But Darrow cuts him off, saying there's no point in lying, she's known all along that he's human. Romerk had already spilled the beans to her a long time ago. Ike stunned and asks why she didn't just kill him from the start. Darrow explains that she let him live because of her ultimate goal. No matter how much power she has, she can't achieve her wish without people by her side to fight for her. Ike, curious, asks what her wish is. Darrow reveals that she wants to create a peaceful world, and for that, she needs skilled individuals like Ike on her team. Ike, processing everything, says he's happy to serve her. Darrow, pleased with his response, teleports away, leaving Ike with the guns. Later, Ike takes the guns to Sephiro, showing them off so she can finally understand what he was talking about. Sephiro, still confused, asks how she's supposed to make bullets for them. Ike explains it's just a metal ball, but when she conjures one up, it's comically oversized. Ike schools her, explaining that it has to be small enough to fit inside the gun barrel. Sephiro catches on, but she's not too thrilled, making tiny objects. She complains, always gives her horrible acne. Out of nowhere, a massive explosion goes off, startling both Ike and Sephiro. Oddly enough, Sephiro doesn't sense any magic behind it. Ike quickly figures out the cause, it's likely the gunpowder they were messing with. Right then, Fiorentina steps up, letting Ike know she whipped up the powder he asked for. Ike, seeing things coming together, asks Sephiro if she's finished with the bullets. This time, the bullets are perfect, so he asks her to crank out about 500 more. Sephiro, not feeling the tedious work, agrees but immediately dumps the task on Fiorentina. Ike apologizes to Fiorentina, explaining that since Sephiro's not willing to help, he needs her to handle both the gunpowder and bullet making. Fiorentina shrugs it off, saying she's used to it, Sephiro never does her work anyway. The day of the duel arrives, and the stadium is packed with demons, all hyped for some serious action. Bastio starts mocking Ike, pointing out that his puppets only have shields, while Bastio's puppets are fully decked out in armor. He taunts Ike, asking what Sephiro is up to and whether she's scheming anything behind the scenes. But, to Bastio, it doesn't matter, he's convinced he'll win no matter what. His puppets are covered in Damascus steel, tough enough to resist any sword or arrow. Darrow herself had hooked him up with the gear, and Bastio smugly assumes that means she's secretly backing him in this duel. Mike knows exactly what Darrow's intention was when she gave both sides gear. Whether she wanted a fair fight or was testing something, he can always ask her later, after he's won, of course. The match begins, and the rules are laid out again. Each commander controls 50 puppets, and the goal is simple, wipe out the other side's forces. The winner gets the crown, while the loser meets his end. Once everything's settled, the duel officially kicks off. Bastio wastes no time, ordering his archer puppets to rain arrows down on Ike's squad. Ike commands his puppets to block with their shields. While some arrows are deflected, a few still manage to strike his puppets. Sensing an advantage, Bastio orders his puppets to charge and wreak havoc on Ike's troops. Bastio is laughing the entire time, thinking Ike is just playing defense, not realizing Ike has something bigger planned. 
As time ticks by, more and more of Ike's puppets fall, and Bastio seems to be in control. But Darrow, watching from her throne, knows it's far from over. Suddenly, a deafening boom echoes through the arena as Ike's remaining puppets open fire with their guns. The counterattack is on. Ike's puppets effortlessly mow down Bastio's troops, catching Bastio completely off guard. Confused and panicked, he watches as his once dominant forces crumble in an instant. Before long, all of Bastio's puppets are down, lifeless, and he's officially lost the battle. Darrow steps down from her throne to deliver the grim verdict. Though Bastio's defeat is clear, she feels generous and offers him two options. Either he can take his own life, or she'll do it for him, though she assures him her way won't be painless. But Bastio has one last trick up his sleeve, a contingency plan in case he lost. In a split second, one of his archers fires an arrow straight at Darrow's back. Unlike Ike, Darrow senses it coming and catches the arrow mid-air. But what she doesn't expect is the explosive attached to it. The arrow detonates, and Darrow is knocked down by the blast. Chaos erupts as Bastio triggers another series of explosions in the stands, wiping out a number of spectators. Undead soldiers pour into the arena, and Bastio, reveling in the chaos, declares himself the new demon lord, ready to seize control. Many years ago, Romerg went full beast mode in a dark cave, wiping out a vicious wolf pack. In the aftermath of the carnage, he found a family torn apart by the savage creatures. Amid the wreckage, there was a small child, barely clinging to life, protected by the bodies of their parents who had sacrificed everything to shield their child from death. Fast forward to today, the 3rd Battalion, fully loyal to Bastio, was all in on his plan to seize control of the entire demonic army. They caught the orcs off guard, with skeletons and goblins under Bastio's command annihilating everything in their path. Bastio, full of arrogance, swore that once he had the demon forces in check, the whole world would bow to him. Seeing his moment of opportunity, he approached Ike, offering him a chance to join forces, promising victory and even saying that Ike could continue running the 7th Battalion. But as Ike surveyed the battlefield, noticing the orcs getting picked off by the skeletons, he wasn't having any of it. Calmly, he responded that Bastio would never be the demon lord. This threw Bastio off, as he had assumed Ike was smarter than that. Still, Bastio's confidence didn't waver. As his soldiers closed in on Ike, Bastio declared it was the end for him. The group of warriors rushed Ike, but he clapped back with a spell, sending them flying. Bastio, unfazed, kept applying the pressure, forcing Ike to step up his game with even more powerful magic, decimating the attackers. One skeleton threw its skull like a mana bomb. But Ike barely flinched, blocking and countering with another spell, leaving the skeleton zapped. Though Ike was holding his own, Bastio's 3rd Battalion kept fighting under his orders, unshaken by Ike's magical prowess. As Ike moved to higher ground, dodging a barrage of arrows, he surveyed the battlefield from above. From his vantage point, he unleashed a devastating spell that sliced through Bastio's troops like nothing, leaving Bastio in complete shock. As the dust settled, Ike expected Bastio to be finished, but instead, he heard Bastio's voice, laughing. Moments later, Bastio's body reappeared behind Ike, launching a surprise attack as explosions rocked the arena, turning the battlefield into chaos. Ike barely dodged the assault as the whole area turned into a sandstorm of destruction. Bastio taunted Ike, reminding him that he was no ordinary foe. As the head of the Immortal Brigade, Bastio revealed that he was a Dullahan, an undead warrior, along with the rest of his crew. Seeing the enemies he'd already taken down rise up again, Ike knew they weren't going down easy. Bastio's forces, reinvigorated, came back swinging, this time chucking explosive skulls that caught Ike off guard. Meanwhile, a zombie goblin crept up behind Ike, forcing him to act fast. He froze the goblin's arm and shattered it, then cast a time freeze spell, taking out nearby enemies. But no matter how many he took down, Bastio's army kept coming. According to Bastio, his troops were endless. He smugly reminded Ike that no matter how powerful a sorcerer is, magic eventually runs dry. To Bastio, it was just a matter of time before he claimed victory. He even expressed regret, saying he would have loved to have someone like Ike on his side. Just as the situation hit its worst, the same orc archer who had taken a shot at Darrow lined up another, this time hitting Ike with an explosive arrow. The massive blast rocked the area, and for a moment, it seemed like the end. But miraculously, Ike managed to throw up a magical barrier just in time, saving himself from the worst of the impact. Despite surviving the hit, it became clear that his life was hanging by a thread, and the stakes had never been higher. Out of breath, Ike started showing signs of exhaustion, and Bastio noticed. He pointed out that his undead forces were still standing, proving why he led the Immortal Brigade. 
Bastio kept hammering home that resistance was pointless, and Ike was starting to believe it might be true. He had to flip the script fast before things got worse. Ike scanned the battlefield, realizing that the undead were just walking corpses, immune to his dark magic. But the fact they weren't alive sparked an idea. Meanwhile, Bastio, thinking Ike's calm meant surrender, ordered another attack. His forces moved in, but Ike unleashed a blinding spell that wiped out the attackers, with light spreading across the battlefield and taking out the remaining foes. Bastio was stunned. His archer, readying another shot, had his arm sliced off mid-move. Sephiro stepped in, blowing the orc archer sky high and bringing reinforcements. Her demon troops tore through Bastio's forces, wrecking everything in their path. Gyron led the goblin battalions, while Lilith used her unique skills to take down enemies. After charming her way through the monsters, she smirked and announced she was coming for Ike next. Sephiro reached Ike first, telling him the situation was under control. Defeated, Bastio cursed Sephiro, but Darrow reminded him his true rival was Ike. She gave him one last chance, a one-on-one -on -one fight with Ike. If Bastio won, he'd survive. Bastio accepted, swearing to tear Ike apart. The two clashed. Bastio swung his sword while Ike held his ground with a magical shield. But Bastio's strength cracked it. He claimed Ike's fate was sealed and blamed the demon lord for his downfall. Bastio unleashed dark magic. But Ike countered with a bright spell that wiped out the undead and took Bastio's hand. Seeing this, Sephiro was shocked by Ike's white magic. Bastio charged again, not realizing Ike now had the upper hand. Back in the day, a young Ike was staring sadly at a wilted flower when his mentor, Romerk, called him over for his daily magic lessons. Showing natural talent, Ike trained hard under the Guardian of Hell. One day, Ike asked if there was a spell to bring a dead flower back to life. Romerg explained that white magic was the key to such a move. Excited, Ike immediately wanted to learn it, but Romerg reminded him that, as a demon, he should focus on curses, not white magic. Romerg warned that white magic was about love and care, something that wouldn't sit well with demons if they saw Ike using it. If Ike truly wanted to master it, he would need to keep it secret. He also let Ike know that white magic could be deadlier than any weapon for demons. With that knowledge, Ike's determination only grew. Fast forward to the present, in the heat of battle, Ike taunted Bastio, saying aiming to be the demon lord was too much for a weakling like him. Bastio, desperate for power, didn't hesitate to throw his troops under the bus, even if they were undead. Ike, knowing that demons often betrayed their own for power, refused to let Bastio's crimes go unpunished. Believing a true leader should protect their people, not use them. Enraged, Bastio attacked again. Apologizing to Romerg for what he was about to do, Ike unleashed white magic. His left claw glowing bright, Ike pierced straight through Bastio's gut, the light spreading until Bastio vanished entirely. After the fight, Sephiro asked if Ike learned the move from Romerg. Ike confirmed, but pointed out that she knew all along and still left him to face Bastio alone. Sephiro shrugged it off, teasing that Ike managed to win regardless. Now, with Bastio gone, Darrow found herself in a bind. There was no one left to lead the 3rd Battalion. She handed the command over to Ike, making it official before leaving. Later, Lilith and Fiorentina appeared, hyping up Ike's victory, though Lilith was clearly envious of Gyron showing Ike respect. Not long after, Sephiro confronted Darrow, frustrated that her second-in-command, Ike, was taken from her squad. As Ike's boss, Sephiro expected to have the final say in who led her crew. Darrow, surprised by Sephiro's reaction, thought she would be fine with it. However, Darrow, being the demon lord, reminded her that she had the final say over all decisions. To settle things, Darrow called Ike in to get his thoughts and let him make the final call. After the sit-down with Darrow, Sephiro scolds Ike for spilling his human identity to the demon lord. She's even more frustrated when she sees that Ike isn't even worried about it. Just earlier, Ike had mentioned to Darrow that people were starting to get used to the new Ielus. At first, demons and humans didn't know how to coexist. But over time, things had changed. Now, all races were living in harmony, working together for the greater good, something that had been unthinkable before. Even the youngest in Ielus weren't scared of the so-called monsters anymore, and what was happening in the city was truly special. Since day one of serving under Sephiro, Ike had made it clear that his mission was to build a world where humans and demons could live together peacefully. Now, ditching his mask, he apologizes for keeping his human identity a secret. But he still has a lot to learn from Sephiro. In return, he pledges to make Yellas the first place where both races can live in true peace. After Ike and Sephiro leave, Darrow reflects by her window on everything she has just learned. The scene shifts to Ike standing at a high point, looking out over Yella's. Sadie walks up and asks what he's doing there. Ike explains that he's been researching ways to make the city even more productive and sustainable. 
he mentions a farming method called the nori system, which can boost crop production without letting fields rest. Sadie, a bit puzzled, asks what that means, and Ike simplifies it by saying it's a way to grow more food without taking breaks. When he jokes that she'll be able to eat as many turnips as she wants, Sadie is excited. Ike tells her that soon they'll be busy creating a town where humans and demons can live happily together. Next, we see a scene of the human army clashing with demons trying to take over another town, and the humans manage a big victory. Then, we cut back to Ike using his magic to make it rain on the fields. He explains to Sadie that right now they grow wheat, let the fields rest, then grow grass for livestock, which leaves the fields empty for long stretches. Instead, they're going to rotate crops, barley, clover, wheat, and turnips, so they can keep the fields productive without needing rest periods. Sadie asks if they can eat clovers too, but Ike explains that clovers are for the livestock. He promises that if this system works, neither demons nor humans will ever go hungry, and the idea excites everyone involved. Later, Ike is in his study when Sadie brings him some tea, congratulating him on his new vice commander title. Ike brushes it off, saying it's no big deal, just a role that needed filling. Suddenly, Jiren bursts in, looking frazzled. Ike asks what's going on, and Sadie reminds Jiren to address Ike by his new title. Jiren, realizing his mistake, quickly apologizes and offers to take any punishment. But Ike is only interested in hearing the news. Jiren struggles to recall why he came in, and Ike guesses it might be about the Alliance of Kings. Jiren finally remembers and explains that the Alliance's army started moving last night, and the Second Corps, tasked with taking over Alista, had been defeated. The Second Corps was made up of fierce warriors, skilled and experienced, and Jiren never imagined they'd lose so badly. Ike quickly pieces it together and realizes that the Alliance of Kings must be involved. The clueless Sadie asks what the Alliance of Kings is, and Ike explains that it's one of the oldest treaties in human history. Whenever the Demon Lord's army becomes too strong for any one nation to handle, all the nations on the continent join forces under this alliance to take the demons down together. Jiren asks Ike if the Alliance army has ever mobilized in the past, and Ike confirms that it has, three times, in fact. Each time, the demon army was defeated. Hearing this, Jiren starts to worry about their own safety, and Ike tells him that Yelas is likely to be the Alliance's next target. He explains that the humans have already retaken Arsum, which is a crucial base for their operations. To maintain control, they'll have to launch their next offensive from the front lines in Yelas. Ike points out that while demons are typically stronger than humans in a one-on-one -on -one fight, the real challenge lies in fighting against the humans' overwhelming numbers and their ability to work together. If the Alliance captures Yelas, their next move will be a direct attack on Arsum, and with superior numbers, they'll launch a concentrated strike that could lead to the fall of Arsum. Should that happen, the demon army would be forced to retreat back to Dober BG, their main stronghold. Jiren, concerned, notes that this is a grim situation. Ike agrees, adding that if this comes to pass, his dream of building a peaceful town where humans and demons can coexist will be crushed. He then states that the only way to counter the humans' numerical advantage is with guns. The scene shifts to Fiorentina discussing the situation with Ike and Sephiro. Fiorentina explains that mass-producing guns through alchemy isn't possible. Curious, Sephiro asks why. Fiorentina demonstrates by showing them an alchemically created gun, but it breaks after just one use, proving too weak to be reliable. Sephiro questions whether they even need guns, suggesting they could simply use magic to flatten the humans instead. Ike points out that using magic on such a large scale would cause massive destruction, making it nearly impossible to rebuild afterward. He explains that they need weapons that are easy for anyone to use if they're going to fight the Alliance of Kings. Fiorentina agrees but warns that mass-producing guns will be difficult, though it might be possible if they make the parts separately and then assemble them. Sephiro asks how they'll produce such small parts, and Fiorentina suggests that the dwarves might be able to help. Sephiro notes that the dwarves have been defeated by the humans and are now scattered as a wandering tribe. They'll need a lot of dwarves to manufacture the weapons they need, so she asks how they're going to gather them all. Fiorentina has no answer, but Ike steps in with a plan to free the Dwarf King, who is currently imprisoned in the Alf Kingdom. The scene shifts to the Dwarf King, Gunther, trapped in a cell. He reminisces about how the humans wiped out his people. After their defeat, the humans taunted him, reminding him that things wouldn't have ended this way if the dwarves had just cooperated from the start. The king had refused to let the humans use their technology for war, but when they took his son hostage, he had no choice but to comply. The dwarves were forced to work for the kingdom and were later dispersed across the land. 
As Gunther reflects on this, he notices the guards outside his cell are asleep. Suddenly, Lilith shows up and unlocks his cell. Shocked to see a demon, Gunther asks what she wants. Lilith tells him to follow her, but his constant questions irritate her. Annoyed, Lilith puts him to sleep just like she did with the guards. Jiren arrives, surprised by what Lilith did to the king. She explains she got fed up with his questioning. Jiren picks up Gunther, and the two begin their escape. Believe they're not encountering any more guards, Jiren is focused, but Lilith complains, finding the escape too dull. Jiren reminds Lilith they were told to keep a low profile. Lilith insults him, claiming he smells bad, which ticks Jiren off. The noise alerts the guards, and Lilith takes them out by draining their vitality. Jiren scolds her, saying they were supposed to avoid fights. Lilith brushes him off, saying she'll report his behavior to Ike, and Jiren begs her not to. Finally, they escape the dungeon, but they're spotted by a group of soldiers. Lilith begins draining the soldiers' energy, but she leaves them alive. From a distance, Ike sees the commotion and thinks, we were supposed to be discreet. Lilith and Jiren bolt, with Lilith unable to absorb more vitality because she's already full. Jiren is confused by the number of soldiers, wondering why there are so many left when the Alliance was supposed to have dealt with most of them. Ike uses his magic to stop the soldiers from chasing them and asks if everything went smoothly. Jiren assures him they've got the Dwarf King, but Ike is surprised to see how roughly they're handling him. Jiren tries to wake Gunther up by spinning him around, and Ike reminds him to be gentle. The scene cuts to Gunther waking up in a house in Iela's, with Ike sitting beside him. Gunther asks why he's been freed, and Ike shows him a gun, asking if he can make more. Gunther examines the gun, acknowledging it's complex but something he can replicate. However, he has no intention of working for the demons, suspecting Ike only wants to use him like the humans did. He refuses to be anyone's slave. Ike understands why Gunther feels that way but explains that the guns are necessary to achieve peace between humans and demons. Gunther is confused, not fully understanding what Ike means, so Ike asks him to follow along. He shows Gunther how humans and demons are living together in harmony in his city, explaining that this is why he needs his help, to create a world where both races can coexist. Gunther finds the idea interesting but still hesitates pointing out that humans exploited the dwarves and destroyed their homeland. He doesn't want to help if it will just benefit the humans. Mike then asks if Gunther would reconsider if he could help restore peace. He promises that if Gunther helps mass produce firearms, he'll ask the demon lord to rebuild the dwarf kingdom. Gunther, skeptical, thinks Ike is messing with him and tells him not to make empty promises. He argues there's no point in rebuilding a nation without its people, but Ike insists he's serious and offers to prove it. Ike takes Gunther to a smithy, where a group of dwarves are busy crafting guns. Gunther is shocked to see his people hard at work and thriving. The dwarves are overjoyed to see their king again, leading to a heartwarming reunion between Gunther and his son. Gunther struggles to grasp how all of this happened, and his son explains that the demons showed up, gave them a place to live, and reunited the dwarves. They're grateful to Ike for keeping his word and eager to repay him by showing off their craftsmanship. Ike asks Gunther again if he's willing to support his ambitious plan, and this time, Gunther agrees to lend a hand. They shake on it, and Gunther notes that Ike's hands are surprisingly warm for a demon. Later, Ike returns to his study, where Sadie tries to make tea for him. He tells her to take a break and get some rest, but Sadie admits she prefers staying busy to keep her mind off things. Ike suggests she could read to pass the time, but Sadie admits she can't read. Ike, surprised, tells her that reading is important and promises to teach her when he has free time. Their quiet moment is interrupted when Lilith bursts in, immediately accusing Sadie of trying to seduce Ike again. Sadie, calm and composed, replies that she's just helping her master, but the two quickly start bickering. Ike tries to mediate, but their argument is cut short when Jiren rushes in, reporting trouble. The scene shifts to the Allied Nations army gathered outside Yelas. One of the soldiers informs the general that the Dwarf King has been freed by the demons. The general dismisses the news, not worried at all, saying the old man won't be of much use to the demons. Another soldier arrives, and the general asks how many troops are stationed in Yelas. The soldier reports that there are currently 500 troops, but with the brigade commanders arriving to reinforce them, the number will increase. The general then asks about the total size of their forces and learns they've amassed 12,000 soldiers. Confident with such a large army, the general declares there's no way they can lose this battle. So, guys that's it for today's video. Comment part 2 if you want the next part. Till then watch the following video, and I will catch you in the new one.